Hey guys, so this video is going to be about frames of reference and Lorentz transformations. So we've already been doing this a little bit when we talk about time dilation, um, but now we really need to be very careful about which frames we're talking about and what exactly the frame is. Um, things are going to get confusing. So I want you to have a good example where you see um, two frames moving relative to each other and how Lorentz transformation works and what framework we're going to use to understand um, those kind of problems. So let's get started. So the first thing we need to know is what is a frame? So a frame is basically the assignment of a coordinate system, which is usually attached to an object. And because it's attached to that object, that object is at rest in that uh, coordinate system. In this class, we will have to deal with both inertial and non-inertial frames. Uh, at the moment, in relativity, we only want to deal with inertial frames. Inertial frames are frames which are not accelerating. The reason we deal with inertial frames and inertial frames only in relativity is basically because the principle of relativity, those two postulates, which showed up in my last video, only apply to inertial frames. Um, that doesn't mean that in this class we won't discuss non-inertial frames and haven't discussed non-inertial frames. In fact, a great example of a non-inertial frame is anything that's undergoing uniform circular motion. So in this class, we've done uniform circular motion before, but we've been very careful to not talk about what's happening in the frame of the uniform circular motion. So a car going around a curve, we haven't talked about what happens inside the car. We haven't talked about what happens on the ball as the ball goes in a circle around the string. This is because once you go to that frame, Newton's second law still applies, laws of physics still are true, but you have additional forces which are just due to the fact that you're accelerating. Um, these are called fictitious forces, and we don't usually want to deal with them. And in fact, in relativity, uh, inertial frames are part of the postulates of relativity. Non-inertial frames um, are not part of the postulates, so we have to stay in an inertial frame if we're going to use the special relativity that we've been learning in this class. So that's why we're only going to talk about inertial frames, and now it becomes very important to differentiate between the two. So let's do a simple example to try to illustrate what I mean by a frame and what some of the pictures look like when you start talking about frames. So the example is observing signs from a moving car. The first frame we have is the frame of the road. This is the frame that the sign is stationary in. Uh, I'll give some coordinate system for this thing. X and Y. Uh, the frame is called S. This is basically just a convention that comes from the book. Sometimes they're called O in other textbooks, but we're going to call the frame S. So here's my sign. It's located at some position X, Y in frame S. So now I want to consider a car which is moving relative to this sign. That frame is going to be called S prime. It's given right there. I want it to be moving in that direction with some speed V. And the coordinates in that frame are not going to be the same X and Y. They're going to be a different X and Y. Let's just call them X prime, Y prime for the moment. So what is happening to this, the sign in the frame of the car? You've been in cars. You know what this is like. Signs come towards you. Signs move towards you with some velocity, actually with the same velocity that you're driving with. So, in the frame of the car, the velocity of the sign is negative v. It's the same speed as the car, but it has a negative sign because it looks like the frame is coming towards me. So in my frame, it's moving in the negative x direction. So then I can ask, what is the x and y position in each frame of this sign? Well, in the fixed frame, the sign isn't moving, obviously, relative to the road. The sign isn't moving on the road side. So x and y are constant, but x and y might be changing in the frame that's moving, and so the transformation law for that is that this is called the Galilean transformation. This is named after Galileo, of course, for Galileo and his contemporaries. The time was an absolute. Time in different frames was an absolute concept. This is before Einstein came along and shook things up. Um, like we talked about in the time dilation video. But of course, you could have probably just figured this out on your own. The x position in the frame of the car has to be decreasing because the sign is getting closer and closer and closer to the car. How much is it decreasing? Well, just from kinematics, you know that the change in the position over some time period is v times t. So that's where that comes from. The y position doesn't change because the velocity is not in the y direction. So that feature is actually going to hold true in Lorentz transformations as well. but this is not going to be the right form for a Lorentz transformation. And at this point, I think I'll just write down the Lorentz transformation so you can see the difference between the Galilean one and the Lorentz one. 
So here's the Lorentz transformation. You can see it's the same as the Galilean transformation, but times this factor gamma. And then also the time is not the same. We can write the uh, time transformation in the Galilean ones. T is T prime. The time is absolute in a Galilean transformation, so it doesn't change. But in Lorentz transformation, the time changes like gamma times T minus V over C squared times the position X. So I'll go on to give a few more details about the Lorentz transformation. Um, but I want you to keep in mind the differences between the two. It starts out with the same basic factor, but then it's multiplied by the relativistic gamma, and the time is a big difference as well. Time in Galilean transformations is an absolute across the entire universe, but in Lorentz transformations, the time elapsed in different frames is different. This is a consequence of time dilation, or um, this is where time dilation comes from, depending on your particular uh, point of view. So here's the full Lorentz transformations uh, for a frame which is moving with a velocity v along the x direction. That means that the y and z do directions do not transform, whereas the x and t directions do. This thing over here, this is the Greek letter gamma. This is the relativistic gamma factor. This is one of the most important things um, in this chapter, and knowing the definition of this is going to be very important because it shows up in all these equations. That's why we have it separated out as a specific thing. Um, it tells us actually how big the relativistic effect is. When gamma is 1, this is 1, this becomes the Galilean transformation. This is also becomes a Galilean transformation when gamma becomes 1. When gamma is very large, the relativistic effects are very large. So we have a couple of things to notice about the Lorentz transformations. We have no transformation perpendicular to the velocity of the frame. I've already mentioned this. If we're moving in the x direction, then the y and z directions do not transform. Another thing is that if the velocity of the frame is in the negative x direction, these have been derived for the positive x direction, but if we have the negative x direction, just change the sign on the velocity and that will be a transformation into a frame which is moving towards you instead of a frame which is moving away from you. And the last thing is that if you, these, these transformations take you from the unprimed to the primed frame. If you want to go the other direction, if you want to go s prime to s from primed to unprimed, first take the negative velocity thing, put a negative sign in front of this and this, and then exchange primes. So this becomes x prime and this becomes x. That will get you a transformation which goes backwards from the prime frame to the unprimed frame. So that covers how to get between different positions in different frames. But if you have a velocity transformation, you can sort of think that you have to change both the position and the time. So you sort of have to simultaneously do two uh, Lorentz transformations if you have a velocity in one frame and you want to transfer that velocity into a, another frame moving with a relative velocity v. So I'll show you how to do that. The first thing we want to do is we want to start with the Lorentz transformation and take the differential of those transformations. So here's the Lorentz transformations. The reason we want to take the differential is, of course, because the velocity is the derivative dx dt. So we're going to need to know what dx and dt are. So I'll take the differentials of these. If you don't like how I've taken these uh, differentials by just taking dx prime without some taking the derivative with respect to something, you're going to have to trust me on this. But this is just a, a small value of dx prime, and it's given by gamma times a small value dx minus v times a small value dt. But the reason that we're going to do this is because the definition of velocity is dx prime over dt prime. And if we just start plugging stuff in, we can figure out what the velocity of some object is going to be in a moving frame. So there's the first step. This is just going to be some algebraic manipulations. And for this step, I've just taken this dt and moved it to the top. That kills this dt and makes this dx over dt. Well then, we now have dx dt. That's the velocity of the object in the original frame. So we get our final answer for uh, the velocity transformation formula for frames which are moving very close to the speed of light. Starts with the velocity in the first frame, v is the velocity of the moving frame, and then this gives you the velocity of the object in the moving frame. This is equation 9, 11 in your textbook. So this is kind of a complicated formula. I don't necessarily expect you to be able to derive it in the way that I've done here, but you should be able to use it. If I give you a frame, and I give you an object moving in that frame, and I give you some other frame which is moving, I sh you should be able to tell me what the velocity of the object is in that new frame. This can get very confusing. We'll do some examples in class to make sure that you can kind of get it. 
Two things to note. Since this thing was derived using the Lorenz transformations, the same deal goes for the velocity if the frame is moving in the opposite direction. Just throw a negative sign in front of the velocity and these things become positive. And the other thing to notice is that if the velocity of the object in the frame gets close to the speed of light, then the transform velocity in the moving frame must also go to the speed of light. That's essentially just a result of the postulates of relativity, and that is um, when something moves at the speed of light in one frame, it moves at the speed of light in all frames. So if you do the transformation, then in one frame, if it's very close to the speed of light, then in the other frame, it should also be at least very close to the speed of light. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about frames and Lorentz transformations. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in the next class.